This is Exawatt, a revolutionary modular system that produces energy from the sun, stores it, and feeds it back to the grid. But it does this without solar panels or lithium ion batteries. Instead, it uses old school tech like Stirling engines for energy production, for now lenses for light gathering, and blocks to store energy as heat. It, it is a fascinating technology and it might just make sense for the future of sustainable energy. So how does it work and does it live up to the claims? Let's figure this out together. I'm Ricky and this is Tuba Da Vinci. This video is brought to you by Odoo. So what exactly is Exawatt building? Their flagship product, the P3, which stands for three products in one, is a wild combination of technologies. First, you have Fresnel lenses, an invention from the 1800s, first used to help guide ships in lighthouses. These lenses track the sun and focus its light with incredible intensity. That focused sunlight is then converted into heat and stored in a second component, a thermal battery. These are basically hot bricks, solid blocks of clay and ceramic materials heated to a blistering 1000 degrees Celsius or 1800 degrees Fahrenheit stored in an insulated container. Finally, to convert that heat into electricity, they're using a 200 year old Scottish invention, the Stirling engine. A blower drives hot air through the hot bricks and that superheated air powers the Stirling engine, which generates electricity on demand. All of this, the collector, the battery, and the engine is packed into a bright orange 40 foot shipping container. Each container delivers about 25 kilowatts of power, but because they're modular, you can just keep adding more to meet your power need. Their claim? They can deliver power 24-7 for just 4 cents per kilowatt hour, with a future target of just 1 cent. We're talking less than half of what solar PV costs today without battery storage. What we do is we literally ship these out of the factory on the back of a semi truck. They arrive on site and you put it on the ground. Again, as engineers, you want to build the biggest thing that looks very efficient on paper. You forget about construction costs. You forget about shipping costs. You forget about like, imagine I build this huge turbine. Do you know how difficult it is to like transport a turbine? I'm sure you've seen like, and and that's what we're optimizing for. And, and I think we've done that to a great degree and we need to continue to do that to ultimately bring down the, the cost of the system to a point that our levelized cost of electricity is one cent of kilowatt hour or, or even lower. Now to understand why a company like Exawatt even exists, we need to talk about AI's dirty secret. It's massive appetite for energy. The models powering services like ChatGPT are doubling in size every few months and data centers are struggling to keep up. We've covered solutions like Saluna, which can help with energy demand for training these models. But the real consumption comes from the billions of queries that you and I are making each and every day. A single ChatGPT prompt can use 10 times more energy than a simple Google search. And that consumption grows with every every follow-up question as that AI has to remember the entire conversation. Combined, services like ChatGPT, Gemini, and Claude are now consuming as much electricity as small countries. To put that in perspective, today's global energy demand for running these models could power over 600,000 American homes for an entire year. And that demand is constant, 24-7, something that intermittent solar and wind are having a tough time handling. Beyond that, renewables aren't being deployed fast enough to meet the growth of these AI systems which could make up 9% of our total energy demand by 2035, according to Bloomberg. This is where Exawatt hopes that their technology can be the answer. First, it's modular. By packing everything into a standard shipping container, they can be deployed almost anywhere quickly and easily. They don't even need grid interconnections, so you can bypass years of queues and waiting for permission. They're also built entirely in the US using simple materials like steel, glass, and ceramic. So there are no complex supply chain risks or rare earth minerals like you have with batteries. And unlike lithium batteries that degrade every year, Exawatt just uses hot bricks to store energy. And they claim that their thermal battery can last 30 to 50 years with almost no loss in performance. I mean, they're just bricks after all. From tracking the sun to optimizing energy supply and demand, software is at the heart of pretty much everything. It's why I have to tell you about our sponsor this week, Odoo. Odoo is the all-in-one business operations software that offers a range of applications for CRM sales, marketing, accounting, inventory, point of sales, and even custom websites. Your first application is free for life with unlimited hosting and support included and a custom domain name for the first year. Here's my site so far, but I wanna make a few changes. First, I don't like how big these cards are, so let's shrink them down and add a border radius for a nice clean look. I'm going on nearly 10 years as a YouTuber and trust me, the hardest part is staying consistent and organized. With Odoo's project, app, it's as easy as creating cards and updating progress. Invite your whole team and keep everyone in lockstep with notifications and chat. And their plans include all their apps. So if you're using QuickBooks for invoicing and Salesforce for CRM, you can save a ton of money by switching to Odoo. It's why it's the number one open source integrated business app suite. 
You can get started for free. And as your company and team grow, you can rest easy knowing that Odoo has all the tools you'll ever need now and in the future. Use our links in the description for the best deals possible and get started today. Huge thanks to Odoo and you. Now back to the show. But let's address the elephant in the room. These are all technologies that have looked amazing on paper, but failed in the past. Sterling Engine Systems, a similar company, went bankrupt in 2011. What's worse, when these companies were trying to compete, solar panels were 10 times more expensive than they are today. And those costs keep coming down. Today, cheap solar panels and batteries dominate the world. So why is Exowatt's approach even viable? We've covered other tech in the past that competed on solar based on the prices of the day, but few have predicted just how affordable panels and batteries would become. So does this make sense? Based on our research and Exowatt's claims, the answer is yes, and it all comes down to the numbers. First thing I really want to look at is cost, since it's at the core of what they're doing. We found numbers based on a calculator on their website and did the LCOE, the levelized cost of energy calculations, ourselves. This is what we found assuming a 30-year lifespan. Accounting for the capital expenditure, the energy generation, and everything else, the numbers showed that this energy should cost around 2.7 to 3.3 cents per kilowatt hour at a 50-year lifetime it drops to around 1.7 to 2.3. This is right in the ballpark of solar PV without federal tax incentives, which are pretty much all but dead thanks to the One Big Beautiful Bill Act written into law on July 4th. Companies usually exaggerate their figures, but in this case, Exowatt's claims of four cents per kilowatt hour seem to hold up, especially considering we didn't include other hidden costs. I know many of you are probably thinking, why on earth go through all that trouble? Why not just install solar panels and batteries? A large part of the answer is cost. While the LCOE of utility scale solar is around 2.3 cents per kilowatt hour, if you add battery storage, it jumps up to 11.6 cents per kilowatt hour. And that only covers about eight hours of electricity, not 24. Exowatt's P3 already integrates storage. So the LCOE we just calculated is the actual final value. And as of today, Exowatt is a much cheaper alternative for 24 seven power. But there is another issue that critics have cited, which is land use. According to these same early numbers, a 50 megawatt plant for a data center would require over 900 acres, more than New York City's central park and double the land needed for a solar farm. That works out to 18 to 22 acres per megawatt of power, while utility scale solar plus storage takes up about 5 to 10 acres. We asked Exowatt CEO Hanan Hapi about this, and his answer was surprising. Our rule of thumb is if you're charging only from the sun, so no resistive charging, per megawatt hour it's 0.6 acres. It's actually less, yeah, it's 40% less than the equivalent solar PV and yeah, battery system have. So from over 20 acres per megawatt down to just 0.6, that's a huge difference that'll raise more than a couple of eyebrows. So we ran the numbers ourselves to compare. The first thing I thought was to compare a utility scale solar panel with a P3 unit head to head. A solar panel used for utility scale solar is bigger than the ones we have at home. They're usually around 6.5 feet by 3.25 feet with 72 cells that produce around 500 watts of power, which works out to about 0.97 acres per megawatt. The P3 is a 40 foot container with eight foot sides. It needs around three feet per side for its foundation based on the pictures of installed units and generates around 25 kilowatts. That works out to 0.59 acres per megawatt, which is actually 39% less than the solar panels almost exactly what Hanan had said. And this is where the devil's in the details. If solar panels have a land use index of about one acre per megawatt, why do reports state that utility scale solar takes up five to 10 acres per megawatt? Why the difference? Well, it comes down to the spacing you need to add between rows of panels. You can't just put them bunched up because they'll produce shade on each other when the sun is low. So then that same logic probably would apply to exawatts P3. So how much land use would that take? We couldn't find exact information, but we looked at this high res image from Exowatt's website showing a render of a model plant. The site has 640 P3 units for an output power of 16 megawatts. We did some extrapolations and measurements in the image and found that it covers around 36.76 acres, working out to about 2.3 acres per megawatt. So yeah, it's definitely not 0.6 acres per megawatt, but it isn't 20 acres either. We're talking about two to four times lower land use than a conventional solar farm with storage. That means that you can make an Exowatt power plant half to a quarter of the size for the same output and have 24 hour dispatchable power. When you bring all of this together, low maintenance, long life, low material supply chain risk, 
this starts to be quite interesting and it could be a game changer. Now, the next question has to be efficiency. A traditional solar panel is around 20% efficient at converting light energy into electricity. So how does this compare? I asked Hanan about it. And even though they don't focus on efficiency, they told us that they get around 60 to 70% efficiency converting light to heat. The total system efficiency of about 15 to 18%. This means that their Stirling engine is about 21 to 30% efficient, which is pretty good. But the entire business model of Exawatt is like SpaceX. They obsess about economics, not pure efficiency. The most important thing, I think, and, and this is like something that we as engineers always not forget about, but we put it as a secondary, is we as, uh, as a company are not so much focused on the efficiencies as much as we're focused on the unit economics of the system. So in many aspects of the design, and this product has gone through 50 plus configuration designs, we sacrifice efficiency for the sake of unit economics and costs because our ultimate goal is not to make the most efficient product. It's actually to make the product that can generate electricity at one cent per kilowatt hour. And of course, efficiency plays into that, but a bigger role is the, the cost of making the modules, the cogs, the shipping, the installation, the maintenance. And that's where we spend a lot of time optimizing and perfecting it. Now, this is actually probably a good move because even in the world of solar panels, the best selling ones are the ones that are the most cost effective, not the best performing ones. There might be panels that are 25% efficient, but if it costs twice as much, people will keep buying the 21% efficient panel. So then we have a system of converting sunlight into hot bricks in a shipping container. Why should we care? Well, because if Exawatt succeeds, we could enable the ramping up of AI, which is going to happen without completely going backward on our renewable energy goals. It could be another alternative option for companies that need more power production. And it could be the clean, reliable backbone for the world 3.0 infrastructure that powers everything from medicine to transportation. This part is really important. We've been cleaning up our act. We've been producing more of our energy from clean sources for some time now. You've probably heard a lot of companies claim that they're going to be carbon neutral or carbon negative in their operations by 2035 or whatever the case might be. But have you noticed that companies have stopped making those claims that they don't talk about that anymore, it's because we're now facing a new frontier. If Google or Apple or America in general wants to maintain dominance in the world of AI, this frontier is going to mean producing as much energy as possible and building the data centers. So when you're facing a new frontier, a new gold rush, that's not the time the companies stop and try to be more efficient. They want to go out and stake their claim. That's why this is so important and why we're going to cover these topics here in the future. So like and subscribe so you don't miss any other ideas that companies are investing in. So here are the pros of a system like Exawatt's P3. 24-hour dispatchable power. That means that it can produce energy when the sun is up, store it, and release that energy to the grid when needed. Something solar and wind couldn't do without batteries. Two, there's no battery degradation. The thermal battery lasts for decades without losing capacity, unlike lithium ion. Plus, it has really low maintenance as well. Three is a domestic supply chain. With all these materials being sourced and produced here in the US, it simplifies complex geopolitics and supply chain risk in a major way. Four, it's proven technologies. While the combination is new, the core components have been around for over a century. Five, low land footprint. It requires significantly less land than a comparable solar and battery installation. And finally, it's competitive on cost. Every part of this system has been built for cost optimization. For materials, engineering methodologies, this thing was made for a target of one cent per kilowatt hour of energy produced. That was the goal and they back solved from there. Here's an example of what I mean. Typical solar trackers that move all day to track the sun are complex. They're three axis. They can move in every direction from summer to winter, day to night, and track the sun perfectly, but they are more expensive. What did Exawatt decide to do? Single axis. All the Fresnel lens does is track the sun day to night. It doesn't optimize in the other axes to account for the shifts in the sun from winter to summer. Could they have had better efficiency and better solar collection if they did? Yeah, they could have, but it would have added to the cost. And their goal again is one cent per kilowatt hour. But it's not all sunshine and rainbows. There are some concerns and some cons that we have to talk about. The first is historical failures. Similar companies using these technologies in different combinations have gone bankrupt in the past. So the skeptics are worried. Then there's geographic limitations. Like all solar tech, it only works well in sunny regions. Some people in the industry argue that for the high reliability required for data centers, only a fraction of these sites are actually eligible for this technology, not the 60% that they claim. But to that point, 
there is something interesting. These hot bricks also have resistive heating, so they can just pull from the grid at times of excess energy production. For example, in California during high noon, we often have too much solar power and nowhere to put it. So it can serve as a traditional battery and export back to the grid at night. So it can produce energy two ways, from the sun on its own or from the grid. One of the biggest challenges every company has to face is proving the technology at scale. It's one thing to build one container, put it somewhere and show that it works. It's another thing to develop the entire manufacturing process and sales funnel to be able to build these by the thousands. We literally started with, how do I get to one cent per kilowatt hour and started building a bill of materials and then just started eliminating line items from it. Like, why do I need this? Why do I need this? How, how can I get rid of this? And essentially try to innovate uh, the, to the product and the configuration that makes sense. Imagine if we, in our manufacturing process, create a step that takes one second. That one second across four or five million units is going to basically delay our manufacturing by 31 years. <laughs> Just one second difference. So it's really important to have that level of attention to every single step, every single penny, essentially, that, that can have a huge impact when you're talking about building millions of units. And it's why those decisions like the tracking only in one axis to simplify the design is so important because the easier it is to build one of these, the more likely they'll succeed. This is after all competing against the massive mature and ever cheaper solar and battery industries, but also against other alternatives like emerging modular nuclear reactors and much more. As Hanan himself told us, the real challenge isn't the science, it's the manufacturing. They have to scale from prototypes to gigawatts, all while ensuring quality control and meeting the extreme 99.999% uptime that data centers demand. Looking at this from an engineering perspective, here are the challenges that I see. First of all, we do have tracking, so we have mechanisms that need grease and lubrication and some sort of a maintenance interval. We can't have dust getting in and seizing up the system because if the Fresnel lenses seize up in the wrong location, your production pretty much goes to zero. The second is you do have a blower fan. Now those are industrially available and probably last a long time, but that does also have another moving part that needs to be addressed. Then of course is the Stirling engine, which is probably the most interesting and largest variables at play. It's unclear exactly how well it'll work and how long it'll last and what sort of a maintenance interval is needed. But if they could figure this out, this would be one of the most fascinating ways of combining all these different pieces of technology into one package that I've seen the last couple of years. This was a fascinating story for me to cover because I try to break this down as an engineer and see the thought process that went behind the design. For example, the standard shipping container makes a ton of sense. It makes it really easy to put these on trucks and get them anywhere that they're needed. Unlike wind turbines that are massive that require police escorts and road closures, these are modular. You could ship one or a hundred day after day or add more over time. Modularity is one of those really important things that people don't think about. Modularity and scale, very Silicon Valley terms that make a ton of sense here. Also, check out that slit at the very top of the opening. That was made because the Fresnel lens can get the light in and minimize the opening to reduce heat loss. But then I was also thinking you'd be heating the bricks kind of unevenly with that heat transfer across the bricks. There's so much to this story. So if you would like me to reach out and get an on-site tour and bring you an episode of this technology, hands-on, sound off below. And what do you think? How big of an impact could this have? And what technologies do you see emerging in this new age where we need to have a race for clean energy solutions? Sound off in the comments below. And until next week, check out this video that we did on kite energy, using kites flying in tidal waves in the ocean to produce energy next. I'm Ricky Tua Da Vinci. Thank you so much for watching.